Good evening. Good evening. We're, we're going to begin to develop a little bit further the repetition of the Millerite history <coughs> in our day and age. And purposely, I want to erase this so I could put it back up on the board so that we can repeat it in, and remind ourselves of the sequence of every reform movement, but um, in particular to start with, the reform movement of the Millerites. Um, the first way mark that we've been identifying over the weekend is the time of the end, 1798. Every reform movement um, would begin at this point where there's a prophecy fulfilled that sheds light upon the upcoming his sacred history. At some point in time, uh, the message of that particular history would be formalized with the Millerites. The Lord used William Miller to do so in 1833. And Miller began to present the first angel's message, and it went through history until it was empowered on August 11th, 1840. If you're not familiar with this, um, now, and the reason, when, I'm, when I say if you're not familiar with this, what I'm saying about August 11th, 1840, this history of the Millerites and the truths understood and preached by the Millerites has been buried in Adventism through the receptions of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. But generally, we have a little bit of knowledge about August 11, 1840, because Sister White specifically addresses that in the Great Controversy. She talks about Josiah Litch um, printing a book predicting the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1838, and she talks about when it was fulfilled. Uh, she says the uh, event exactly fulfilled the prediction, and then she further says when it became known, multitudes um, were con convicted of the correctness of the rules of interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. So we're familiar with a little bit of that. But you may not be familiar with the fact that when it comes to prophetic study in Adventism, this date and this prophecy is perhaps the most attacked in Adventism. As you share prophecy around the world from the highest levels, from the theologians to the lay people, um, there is so many arguments why this is not valid, um, I mean, it goes so far that some people actually teach that Sister White, when she endorses this in the Great Controversy, that she really did not write that, that Uriah Smith wrote it and snuck it into the Great Controversy while it was being printed. There's actually people that believe that and teach it and put it in print. All I'm saying is that this particular prophecy and its fulfillment has been a target of satanic attack within Adventism for years and years, and if you're not familiar with that, um, it's good to think about because this this is when the Millerite movement was empowered, this is when the year-day principle was confirmed, and therefore this, this is part of the foundation of Adventism that you, you have to understand correctly if you're going to understand that history. We've been identifying that when that was fulfilled, that a divine symbol came down like it does in these reform histories to mark when the message of that time is empowered. And the divine symbol that comes down to mark the empowerment um, is the angel of Revelation 10, which Sister White tells us is Christ. I've said more than once that in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21, Sister White says in June of 1842, the denominations began to close their doors on the Millerites. That's not a two, that's a zero. Huh? Close their doors on the Millerites, and that is the arrival of the second angel's message. Um, some, some brothers and sisters, when they, they hear me make that claim, and they're familiar with what Sister White has said about the second angel's message, sometimes they stumble over this. I'll, I'll tell you what you can stumble over. Sister White has statements where she says, the second angel's message was preached in the summer of 1843 and 1844, 1844. And 
that isn't a contradiction with what I'm saying. If you listen closely, what I'm saying is the second angel's message arrived in 1842, but the Millerites didn't understand that. It wasn't until 1844 that they realized that they were now in the history of the second angel's message, and they began to call people out of Babylon. So there, I'm making a distinction, <coughs> but it's not a contradiction with when Sister White says the second angel's message was proclaimed. Um, so the second angel's message also goes through history. And then at the Exeter camp meeting from August 12 through 17, 1844, Samuel Snow does his presentation that allows them to identify October 22, 1844 as the specific conclusion for the 2300-day prophecy, and the midnight cry is carried forth across the United States, and in less than two months, that message um, goes all the way across the United States. Sister White's one place compares it to a tidal wave. Um, and then the third angel's message arrives on October 22nd, 1844. Millerites didn't understand it at that point, but by faith you could move into the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844, see the, the Ark of the Testament, understand the Ten Commandments within, and understand the Sabbath, and then understand the relationship between the Sabbath, Sunday test, the Third Angel's Message had arrived. Um, so, the Third Angel's Message, as these other two messages, it proceeds through history. <coughs> now, we've been making a case that um, all, every reform movement is the same as all the others, and I want to put a quote here into this so you can see another way to illustrate this other than just the reform movements. And this is from the 1888 materials, page 804. Says the first and second angels' messages. That's this message and this message. It doesn't say the third. It just says the first and second angels' messages are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with this which follows. And what follows the first and second angels' message is the third. So Sister White is teaching here that the characteristics of the third angel's message are to run parallel with the characteristics of the first and second angel's messages. The characteristics of the first and second angel's messages that we've been identifying this week is there's a prophetic fulfillment that begins an increase of knowledge Students of prophecy begin to run to and fro in the prophetic word, understanding the increase of knowledge at some point in time. The message for that history is formalized. The message goes through history until it's empowered. And then there reaches a time where the message is opposed by the enemies. The organized churches close their doors upon the Millerites. And the second way mark, the second angel's message, has arrived. It goes through history until it reaches a point in time where there is once again an empowerment of that message and that message escalates in the midnight cry until the door is closed into the holy place on October 22nd, 1844 and simultaneously the door is closed in the parable of the ten virgins. This is where the Millerites are separated into two, two classes. 49,950 continue to direct their prayers to the holy place, and 50 move into the most holy place of Christ. Sister White says, what follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. And what we're suggesting is the parallel of this history, is that just as William Miller, the messenger of the first angel, presented his message for a period of time before it was empowered, 
that since 1844, the third angel's message has been going through history. That's when it began. It's been proceeding through history. So this, this is the third angel's message proceeding through history. As Seventh-day Adventists, we already understand that the third angel's message will be empowered when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it. So we're saying that right here, we should see the third angel's message empowered, and we know that when it's empowered, it's empowered when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down out of heaven, and the earth is lightened with his glory. Now, if you remember, one of the characteristics of these first waymarks is worldwide. In 1840, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world, Great Controversy 611. The first decree, Cyrus says, I am the king of all the kingdoms of the earth. It was a proclamation to all the kingdoms of the earth. The following two decrees do not make that claim. Um, Darius and Artaxerxes make no mention that they're the king of all the kingdoms of the earth, but the first decree does. With Christ, all of Jerusalem, Judea, and the regions round about came out to hear John the Baptist um, in the geographical setting of that history. It was worldwide. So you only need two or three to establish a thing. One of the characteristics of this empowerment is worldwide. So when we, as Seventh-day Adventists, correctly identify that when the third angel's message is empowered is when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it, we know that verses 1 through 3 of Revelation 18 says that when this angel comes down, the earth is enlightened with his glory. There's your, your worldwide component which agrees with this up here. Now, I haven't read it to you. Uh, Lord willing, we'll get to it this evening. Sister White says that the second angel's message was fulfilled in the United States. And we are making a distinction that is not often made in Adventism, but it is made by others besides myself, even some that have no confidence in what I present, have made, have noted this. And the distinction that we're making is that in Revelation 18, verse 1 through 3, you have a mighty angel that comes down. But in verse 4, it says, and I heard another voice. And we're suggesting that verse 4 is part 2 of the fourth angel's message. There's an A and a B. And verse 4 is where you hear the call, come out of her, my people. And we're identifying that as this way, Mark. And this way mark is associated with the enemies of that history, and we're identifying that as the Sunday Law in the USA. Not the Sunday Law in the world. The Sunday Law is progressive. It begins in the USA. By doing so, what we're saying is, this way mark, in verse 4 of Revelation 18, when the call goes, come out of her, my people, and that begins at the Sunday Law, that we are identifying the activities of the enemies, and that agrees with all these other reform movements. But it also is paralleling the Millerite history because the activities of the enemies in the Millerite history was the Protestant churches closing their doors on the Millerites, and the Sunday Law in the United States is going to be brought about primarily by the Protestants in the United States who come together with Catholicism, and I'm not denying that, but it's still the prophetic parallel, parallel there is sound. Sister White has a statement where she says the term loud cry represents an escalation of power. So when we're talking about the loud cry of the third angel's message, we're talking about a message that increases as it goes to the end. Um, and what I'm suggesting here is it is not, it is, it is okay, it is correct to say that the loud cry of the third angel begins back here when the mighty angel comes down out of heaven. I, that is correct. I don't have a problem with that. But what I'm saying is, even though this message begins back here, it isn't till the Sunday law in the United States separates the wheat and tares in Adventism. And when they are separated by the Sunday law test, then the Lord pours out his spirit without measure upon those Seventh-day Adventists that have the seal of God. And in this sense, this is where this message is empowered, 
and the empowerment of this message in the truest sense is the loud cry. And the loud cry continues to escalate until <coughs> Michael stands up and human probation closes. The midnight cry escalated until Michael moved from the holy place to the most holy place and judgment began. The loud cry escalates until Michael takes off the priestly attire and probation closes. And we've already noted that then Adventists had the work of understanding the Sabbath. And it's at this point that the seven last plagues begin. We've all, all we noted last night that in both these histories we can demonstrate a scattering that is coming to a conclusion. In the Millerite history, it was the scattering of the 2520. In our history, it was the scattering that was identified by William Miller, um, identifying the, the burying or covering up of the foundational truths of Adventism before we reached the end of the world. Um, let me read a couple refer references to you. This is Selected Messages, Book 3, page 412. It says, Another angel is to come down from heaven. This angel represents the giving of the loud cry, which is to come from those who are preparing to cry mightily with a strong voice. The, the point that, that I want you to see here, if you were, would, and Sister White says this in a variety of ways, more than once, Sister White identifies the angels of Revelation 14 and the angels of Revelation 18, not as angels, but they represent the work that the people of God do. And, and that, that's um, what she's saying here. This angel represents the giving of the loud cry. He's not representing an angel. He's representing the work that takes place. Mm -hmm. The 1888 materials, page 926, says this. John saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. That work is the voice of the people proclaiming a message of warning to the world. So when we approach Revelation 14 and Revelation 18, and we're going to try to understand what the, the first three angels and then the angel of Revelation 18 represent. According to the inspired testimony, it represents the work that is accomplished by God's people. And if, if you don't factor that in, then you'll struggle, you may struggle over the two angels in Revelation 18. And, and what I'm trying to put in place for us here as we go look at these two angels in Revelation 18 is that this is a symbol of a two-step work that's carried out during the latter rain time period. Manuscript um, releases, volume 9, page 291, says, The truth for this time the third angel's message is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, meaning with increasing power. So when we're talking about the loud cry of the third angel, what the loud cry represents is an escalation of, of power. Now, sometimes, I'm, you'll, you'll notice that I'm marking the loud cry, and I hope I'm not being too technical for you tonight. Once we get these little points in place, Will lighten up a little bit. When I'm ta talking about the loud cry, specifically, I'm saying that it, it specifically takes place after the Sunday law purifies the church and the wheat and tares are separated. But I've already said it, and I'll say it again. I'm not denying that it has already began back here before the Sunday law. And if you don't, if you don't factor that in, you can you can find a, a hook to hang your doubts on and, and say that what I'm teaching is incorrect. But Sister White says the loud cry of the third angel began in 1888 with the message of Jones and Wagner. But the reality of it is the loud cry of the third angel truly began on October 22nd, 1844. That's when the third angel arrived. It, and it's and from that point on, the, the light, the truth, the work connected with the third angel has been increasing and escalating in power. But when we get down here to the end of the world, we're going to see the, the, the fullest um, fulfillment of this. This is L slash C, if you're wondering. That's not 4C. That's supposed to be not a problem. Um, 
So um, let's let's go to Revelation 18. Try to put this in place. <coughs> Revelation 18, verse 1 says. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lined with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That, the, the fact of the fall of Babylon, you can trace back to June of 1842. Babylon began its prophetic fall at the end of the world in June of 1842. And that's how Sister White explains it. She says the fall of Babylon took place in, in that time period, but it wasn't complete. The fall of Babylon is a, an escalation, and it began when the religious aspect of the United States closed its door on the Millerite message in the 1842 time period. And it isn't complete until the United States fully fills its cup to the top at the Sunday Ball. So the fall of Babylon, Sister White says, is progressive. But here... There is an announcement about the fall of Babylon when a mighty angel comes down and he cries out. Okay, he's, This angel, whoever he is, he, he has something to say. And then in verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven. So there's two angels in here. There's two voices. There's a two-step work that is being identified here. Now, this may, is, is almost certainly a new consideration for some in this room, maybe most in this room. But those of you that have been here this weekend, let me just give you a little simple logic to help you, you know, not be too threatened by this. If you've walked, most of you that were here last night, I, I, I asked at one point, I said, how many of you seen the, how these reform movements parallel one another, just bam, 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 the, the way marks line up, Right, and everyone said yes. And I said, it's simple to see, and everyone said yes. And it is simple to see. And so my point is this. <clears throat> we know that Revelation 18 is identifying the final reform movement of the 144,000 and the latter reign. So we should expect to see the same characteristics in this history, because they've all pointed forward to this history. Therefore, when you, when you mark these two voices in Revelation 18, all you're doing is consistently applying Revelation 18 with the pattern of the reform movements that have already been established over the weekend. And they, they're, they're there. And that isn't, I'm not saying that that's the argument to make you accept that, but I want you to at least see that we're staying within the boundaries of what we identified over the weekend. Now, I have... I have something to read here, and this, I always feel, I've never had confidence that when I read this, that the audience can follow along, so I always forewarn them about this, okay? It, because this is a little bit of a long passage, and I'm going to have to point some things out to you, and you're going to have to hold them in your mind. What I'm going to do, I'm going to read Sister Wright <coughs> describing the history of the Millerites, in the context of the first, second angels and the midnight cry. She's going to describe the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and the midnight cry. And then, and then, I'm going to read another passage where she describes the characteristics of when the fourth angel joins the third and the loud cry. All right? <clears throat> and when you do that, what I'm saying is I'm going to read her comments on the Millerite history and then I'm going to read her comments on this history. And when she comments, she's going to be speaking about the angels. The first angel, the second angel, the third angel, and the fourth angel. And as she does so, she's going to tell us that the first angel was singular. The second angel was singular. But the midnight cry 
was a group of angels. So she's and she's building a grammatic or a literary illustration of this history, if I'm expressing that right. And then when you come down to this history, she'll do the same thing. She'll identify the, the, the same two-step process and then the group of angels that will identify the loud cry. This is, this is another way to see this pattern, and we need to see this pattern if we can have in order to get a certain comfort level to understand the role of Islam in all of this. And that is where we're heading. So this is a difficult one. It's probably better if you had the quote right in front of you. What do you call that last history? 144,000. I guess you could put remnant. So this is from Early Writings, page 245. I was shown the interest which all have heaven had taken in the work going on upon earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel, and you're going to see by the context in a moment that this is the first angel. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second coming. Now, there's another, there's another nice idea in this paragraph. So, that I didn't tell you about, and I want to tell you about before, before we get there. In the context, you will see clearly, she's talking about the first angel of Revelation 14, okay? Is everyone familiar with the first angel of Revelation 14? Okay. Amen. Amen. Okay, so you know, I'm not losing you, you know, in theory here. But when she comments on this angel, she's going to say that his work was to lighten the earth with his glory. And in the first angel's message of Revelation 14, the first angel, it doesn't say he's going to lighten the earth with his glory. Where is that found? The Revelation That's 18. the fourth angel of Revelation 18. So she's making a direct connection to the work of the first angel with the work of this angel. If you had it in front of you, you could see it. But let me read this again. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second coming. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn man of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes received the light. Another mighty angel, both of these angels have been singular. Another mighty angel was commissioned to descend to the earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing, and as he came to the earth, he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's the second angel's message. Therefore, the one prior to that was the first angel. And then here's, here's the next sentence. As the people of God united in the cry of the second angel, the heavenly host marked with deepest interest the effect of the message. Jesus commissioned other angels, plural, to fly quickly to revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and to prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move which was soon to be made in heaven. I saw that these angels receive great power and light from Jesus and fly quickly to earth to fulfill their commission to aid the second angel in his work. A great light shone upon the people of God as the angels cried, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. So Amen. what you're seeing at a very, I don't know if this is the right expression, at a grammatical level, is she's, she's saying the first angel sing, singular, second angel singular, but the midnight cry is plural. And she's saying the first angel is a parallel to the fourth angel. His work is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. Then in early writings, page 277, she says this. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth, and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel, singular, commissioned to descend to the earth and unite his voice with the third angel, singular. Okay? Singular, third angel, the other angel, singular, two singulars. To unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel, singular, penetrated everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3 that she's quoting from. 
Now notice what she says, and I mentioned this earlier. The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mentions of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. I saw great light resting upon them, and they united fearlessly to proclaim the third angel's message. Now notice which she's been talking about a singular angel, the third angel's message, a singular angel that joins with them, okay? Singular angel, singular angel, but the second angel in the Millerite history was then joined by a group of angels in the midnight cry. So we, you see the parallel so far? Now here's what she says. Angels were sent from were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere come out of her, my people. This is verse 4 of Revelation 18. Okay. It's an absolute parallel, and, and she's marking verse 4 as the parallel to the midnight cry. Okay. Singular, singular, plural. I mean, it, but it's better if you have this in front of you to read it, but it's there. Um, the message seemed to be in addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. So, what I'm saying, and some of you came in a little bit late into this, and this is this is one of the more difficult things we share, so I may have lost you. But what we're saying is that Revelation 18, Verses 1 through 3 is when the mighty angel comes down and joins with the third angel and empowers the third angel's message. But when you get to verse 4 of Revelation 18, you have reached a Sunday law in the United States where the church is purified, the Holy Spirit is then poured out without measure, and the loud cry message of come out of Babylon is given in earnest until the close of probation. So, so when we're suggesting this two-step process in Revelation 18, there are a number of ways to demonstrate that it is valid. Now, don't forget, you know, this is the first time you're hearing this. And but let me ask a question. Those of you that have been here since Friday night, are any of you hearing things that you're unfamiliar with? Are you already put down? <laughs> There's some hands that went up. That's what I expected. I understand it's, that, that some of this is new and it's a little bit hard to drink in the first time around. So if, if tonight you're swimming once again mentally, saying, what is he talking about? Let, re, let me remind you that the only argument, it is not the only argument that I'm making here that this history parallels this history. We've already made these parallels over here as well. You know, what we just went through with the angel, angel, angels is one of several layers to back up this two-step work that is taking place um, in Revelation 18. Um, it, in in uh, Selected Messages, Book 2, page 118, um, it says, The prophet says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And then she quotes verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 18. And she says, This is the same message that was given by the second angel. Babylon is fallen. And she quotes Revelation 14, verse 8. So she's comparing... Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, with the second angel's message. And then she says this. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the te temple. So in the last work for the warning of the world, and that's Adventism. Adventism is the last work for the warning of the world. And when I say Adventism, I'm meaning the beginning of Adventism with the Millerites, the end of Adventism, 
to the 144,000. The work of Adventism is to warn the world, and it's the work that's represented by the angels of Revelation 14 all the way through to the angels of Revelation 18. So in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and she quotes Revelation 14, 8. And then she says this, and in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. And she quotes verse 4 of Revelation 18. In here, she's, she's giving us another prophetic argument, if you can follow it. The climax of the second angel's message in 1844 is where the door was closed in the parable of the ten virgins. It's where the door was closed in the holy place. And it's where the separation took place between the, the foolish and wise virgins of the Millerite time period. 49,950 foolish virgins, 50 wise virgins. If you look at the closing of the door in this reform movement, um, it's here where the door closed on Pharaoh in the reform movement and Egypt in the reform movement of Moses. In the reform movement of Noah, it's here where the door closes. So the door closes for the world here in the final reformation, but judgment at the end as the door closes begins with God's church. And our door closes before Michael stands up as Seventh-day Adventist, and our door closes at the Sunday Law in the United States, and this is where he's cleansing his temple. When Sister White's <coughs> identifying the two cleansings of the temples, she's saying in the history here of the second angel's message reaching its climax, Christ cleansed his temple the first time. He had raised his temple up during the 46 years of 1798 to 1844, and in 1844 he cleansed it and moved into the most holy place. And the second time he cleanses his temple is at the Sunday Law. The Sunday Law, it takes place again. So Sister White's speaking about the two temple cleansings. And she's quoting Revelation 18, verse 4. She's giving added um, testimony that this point here, verse 4 of Revelation 18, is the Sunday Law in the United States, where the Adventist church begins to be purified. If you would turn with me now. We have more to say about this. Um, we'll come back to this. If you turn with me to Luke 21, try to put another component in place in the next few minutes. In Luke 21, verse 7, the disciples ask Christ um, a question that we need to understand. And verse 7 says, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And I said it before, I'll say it again, as I understand it, when there is a question raised in the scriptures, that question wasn't for the disciples that asked the question, that question was for you and I. We're supposed to, to recognize there was a question asked there, and understand the implications, and understand the answer. So this is an important question. And they want to know what the signs of the second coming are, the end of the world. And Jesus is going to tell them, and passing over um, much of what he says down to verse 24, we looked a little bit at verse 24, Sabbath, or last night, we looked at it previously. Verse 24 um, says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. As Seventh-day Adventists, we understand that Luke here is a parallel passage to Mark and to Matthew 24, and when Sister White comments on Matthew 24, she upholds and identifies the principle that as Jesus was telling the disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem that was about to take place then and there, simultaneously using the destruction of Jerusalem as an illustration of the end of the world. So this is, this is the same sermon, only it's how Luke recorded it. And so in verse 24, he's... he's setting forth this dual application about the destruction of Jerusalem. And as we pointed out yesterday, the times of the Gentiles, if you understand the 2520, like we do not in Adventism by and large, there were two 2520 time prophecies. The first concluded in 1798. 
the second concluded in 1844. In this history, the scattering was coming to a conclusion. The gathering of modern Israel was taking place. But a, a, another biblical expression of what is being concluded here is the times of the Gentiles. So, without going any further than that, what I want you to see is that when Jesus is answer, answering their question about the end of the world, when he brings them to verse 24 and references the times of the Gentiles, he's specifically pointing out the Millerite history. Okay, he's taking them to the Millerite history. He's going to address the Millerite history. But we already understand here that the Millerite history is going to be repeated to the very letter. So he's addressing us at the end of the world as well. So in verse 25, speaking of the signs, in order to answer the disciples' questions, it says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and on earth distress of nations with complexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And the signs that led up to the Millerite history, the last um, sign, um, Sister White says, in terms of the, the heavenly phenomenon of the dark day, the great earthquake, was the falling of the stars in 1833. This is the sign that was pinpointed for, by Christ that we're going to point out the reform movement of the Millerites. But there's one other sign in there that I want you to take note of because it is, it is one of the places that we're going to. It says the distress of nations. And what was the distress of nations that was taking place in the Millerite history? I started here tonight on purpose. I said I set you up for this, and I know some of you know, but you don't have to answer. I'll answer now. Russia. I, I, I pointed out at the beginning that when it comes to August 11th, 1840, we understand it a little bit, but we don't understand it as we should. The distress of nations that was identified by prophecy that was taking place in the Millerite history was the fact that the Ottoman Empire was coming to its conclusion in fulfillment of the 391-year, 15-day time prophecy of Revelation 9, verses 14 and 15. In that history, the Ottoman Empire was at the, the end of its ability to continue to bring warfare to Europe. But Egypt wanted to continue the Islamic Jihad against Europe. And Egypt had some power. So Egypt attacked Turkey, actually captured its navy and brought it back to Egypt in order to continue the warfare against Europe. And the Europeans looked at this situation and they said, we've had hundreds of years of Islam bringing warfare against us. We're not going to let Egypt reestablish another Islamic dynasty, continue this jihad. So they interceded into that situation, and on August 11th, 1840, the weak man of the East, the last sultan of Turkey, surrendered his national sovereignty to the four great European powers. So prior to August 11th, 1840, the distress of nations that was pinpointed by Bible prophecy that Jesus pointed to in this very history was Islam. Islam was the distress of nations that was in that history. Um, and and, and that's, not, that's not my interpretation after the fact. That's an agreement with pioneer understanding as represented on those charts. Okay? Um, so if you, if you the, the, the verse here that becomes important is verse 27. And verse 27 says this. See, the disciples said, what are the, the signs of your second coming? And Christ gives some of the signs. He takes them to the history of 1798 to 1840. He takes them to the falling stars, the dark day. He takes them to the distress of Islam that comes to a conclusion on August 11, 1840. And then in verse 27, it says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And in verse 32, still commenting on this, he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. So what Jesus is saying is, the generation that sees these phenomena, the falling of the stars, the generation that sees the distress of nations, this generation shall not pass 
until Christ comes in the clouds. And if you turn to uh, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. You may not remember it, but in one of our first, second, third presentations, we quoted from Great Controversy, where Sister White says that Daniel 8, 14, Daniel 7, 13, and the coming of Malachi to the temple are the same event. Daniel 7, 13 is identifying October 22nd, 1844, where when Christ came with the clouds, into the most holy place to begin judgment. So the Millerites that saw these signs in agreement with what Jesus said in Luke 21, that that generation of Millerites did not pass until Christ came in the clouds of heaven. Amen. Now, we read a quote early on. I won't go back to it. Um, but when we were early on, it was probably Friday night. Some of you may not have been here Friday night. And Friday night we read the quotes where Sister White identifies that both those charts were directed by the Lord. But I also read a quote from James White. Where James White said, if you don't believe that the 1843 chart was a subject of prophecy, if you don't believe, and this is, I'm paraphrasing him, if you don't believe that that chart was produced by the Lord through his prophetic word, and then here's his words, you leave the original faith. Okay, because all, all the Millerites understood that the production of the 1843 chart was something that the Lord accomplished, not men. And they knew which passages of scripture that produced that chart. And we've, we've looked at them here the first night on Friday night. So I want to add one more, one more way mark in the Millerite history. And it, it's right here, in the 1842 time period, 1843 chart is one of the waymarks of this history. And of course, the reason I'm putting that up there is because the message that you're hearing right now, from my understanding, is the message that's paralleling the message of William Miller and John the Baptist. This is the message that gets empowered the third angel's message at the end. This is the message identifying that this history is repeating, and it's the message that leads God's people back to the old past, back to the foundations of Adventism, and it was the Lord's will, he ordained, that the, the teaching tool that allows us to easily go back to the foundations are those charts. The 1843 chart, you can bring it before God's people, show them that the seven thunders have been sealed up, show them what it means to be sealed up, and then ask them, do you understand that chart any longer? And they all say no, demonstrating to themselves that that history has been sealed up. That chart is once again a component of present truth in this history right here. It's different. The Millerites were using it for evangelism, this is being used to try to revive God's people. It has a different purpose, but it's still, it's taking its place in this unfolding history as we speak. So why am I saying that? You may not have remembered, but one of the passages that the Millerites recognized as leading to the production of this chart was Ezekiel 12, verse 21, to the, to the end of the chapter, verse 28, um, and I'm just going to, I'll read verse 25, this is, this is, this is the pa one of the passages that they connect with the production of these charts, and verse 25 of Ezekiel 12 says, For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass, it shall no more be, pro it shall be no more prolonged, for in your days, or if you were going to put this in the context of Luke 21, in that generation, for in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, saith the Lord God. This is, a, this is a promise that the two passages of scriptures that are connected with those charts are identifying that when those charts become a component of history, that the prophecies connected 
with that history will be fulfilled at that time in those days in this generation. What was the last time? That's verse 25. <clears throat> And I'll read onward. Verse 26 says, And again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesy of the times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord. So what I'm suggesting to you is when you understand that the 1843 chart is one of the waymarks of the Millerite history, and that the Millerite history will be repeated at the end of the world to the very letter in the reform movement of the 144,000, that the 1843 chart brings with it a back of two in Ezekiel 12, and the testimony in Ezekiel 12 is that in the days when this chart is established as a waymark, that the prophecies connected with that chart will come to pass. And they did for the, the Millerites. And the fact that the chart is once again becoming present truth is a testimony that the generation we're living in does not pass until the Lord comes. And now I am, I, I think we can do this. If you go back to Luke 21, when Jesus was asked the what would be the signs of the second coming? And he sets forth the signs that we briefly looked at. In verse 29, he gives a parable. He's repeating and enlarging upon what he said. Because, you know, there's a statement where Sister White says, It is the voice of Christ that speaks through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam until the closing scenes of time. Every... Every word of prophecy is the voice of Christ. Amen. Um, so when you look at prophecy and you realize that one of the rules of prophecy is the principle of repeat and enlarge, and then you see Jesus giving the signs, and then he goes into the parable, he's just doing something consistent with himself. He's repeating and enlarging. And in verse 29 he says, And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all of the trees. When they now shoot forth, you know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. And uh, in Jeremiah 8.20, it says the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So when verse 29, um, when verse 30 says the summer is now at hand, according to Jeremiah 8, and the prophets agree with one another, the summer is the harvest. And then in Matthew 13, 39, it says, The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the world. So when it's talking about the summer, in verse 29 of Luke 21, it's talking about the end of the world. And, it, and Jesus says, When you see these, this sign, when you see these things at the end of the world, know that the kingdom of God is at my hand. Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. There is a sign. Brothers and sisters, we haven't looked at it closely. But in each of these histories, there is a sign. If you remember, in the history of Christ, we went to the prophecy in Isaiah 7 that predicted that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. And it would be a sign. And the reason that Isaiah set that forth, the asking is Ahaz, asked the, the sign, and Ahaz didn't want to. So he set forth the sign. Christ was a sign. In the time of Moses, the Bible talks about the signs and wonders that were done in Egypt. Okay? Each of these reform movements have signs, and we know that as Seventh-day Adventists. We know that the Sunday Law is a sign, so we know that we have signs. The Millerites had signs, and Jesus, in Luke 21, is telling us what our sign is at the end of the world. Our sign is, is when you see the trees bud, you know you're at the end of the world. And what is it that causes the trees to bud out in the Middle East? It's the lack of rain. And Sister White says, commenting on Luke 21, if I can turn right to it. Great Controversy 308. Christ had bidden his people watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. When these things begin to come to pass, he said, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. 
he pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Sister White is isolating this sign, not for the Millerites, but for us. And the reason we're making this point, and I'm making it here, we're going to have to develop it further in another presentation. Sister White, in Great Controversy 611, she has a paragraph where she talks about the history of Revelation 18, the latter rain history. And in the next sentence, she says, the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And she talks about that a little bit, and in the beginning of the very next paragraph, she says this history that she just compared with 1840 to 1844, she says it will be similar to the days of Pentecost. And we'll read that um, as we proceed. But the point is this. When Jesus pointed out our sign for the end of the world, he said it was the budding trees of spring, and the budding trees of spring is the latter rain, and the latter rain has been illustrated in these sacred reformatory movements. 1840 to 1844 is an illustration of Pentecost, according to the spirit of prophecy. And Pentecost is an illustration of the latter rain. And when you and I reach the time to where we can see that this history is repeating, we know that we have reached the generation that does not pass until Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And brothers and sisters, it can be demonstrated that we have reached that time. Amen. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we understand that the signs that you put in each of these reform movements are a, a test for your people, that some of us have eyes to see and some of us don't. We ask that you give us all in this room and this hearing of this message, the discernment, to recognize that you are speaking to our hearts and to our minds through your prophetic word that's identifying that the history that's unfolding on planet Earth is identifying that you are now in the final work in the most holy place. And that the work you're doing must be in agreement with the work that we're doing as we participate with you in order that you can perfect our characters and place your seal upon us that we might finish this work and go home. We give you permission to do what it takes in each of our lives to make this happen. We pray for our families and our friends and our Adventist friends that seem to be asleep to the seriousness of the times and the message that you're unfolding. Give us the wisdom and discernment to give a word in due season and, and help them along the way. And we thank you for all these things. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.